Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. We're glad you're all here with us for our NF2 Biobank webinar. We wanted to give you a chance if you wanted captioning to add that to your screen. We have closed live captioning going on today. So in order to do that, please click the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen, select show subtitles, adjust the settings to make them smaller or larger, and flick the, uh, or click, that says flick, the view full transcript option to see the full captioning. A few other housekeeping notes. We will have everybody on mute for the webinar, but we will be taking questions and answers through the Q&A. So please feel free to ask all your questions and so we can get everything answered for you. I am Helene Bader. I'm a volunteer with NF2 Biosolutions, and I wanted to uh, turn this over to Nicole Henwood, who is the founder of NF2 Biosolutions, to just give us a little bit of information about what's going on in our labs. Nicole? Hey, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We're super excited today to talk about the biobank, and I'm sorry about the kids playing in the background. Um, we do we have the screen just that shows our um, projects, Helene? Oh yes, we can turn on Jill's. He needs to show it. There we go. Okay, so this is just a quick um, snapshot here of some of the things that we have going on. This is an image that should be familiar to most of you, but if not, definitely spend a few minutes going through our website and checking it out. But these are the projects that we're supporting currently, thanks to all of you um, and all the donations and support that you've given us. So just a really quick overview. We've got the, the team from Mass General and Harvard, which are the two on the left and the right, Dr. Brenner and Dr. Michelanos. They are collaborating to work on the bacteriotherapy uh, for NF2, which we had a webinar on a few months ago, and that is available on our um, website and YouTube channel. They are working on a method to have bacteria induce um, death of our NF2 tumors. Then we've got the two in the middle, Dr. Flott and Dr. Meyer, and they're both working on gene therapy approaches and not to get into the details too much. But the point of showing you this is that all of these folks who are helping us uh, really need patient-derived cell lines and tumors for them to be successful in what they're doing. So that's what we're here to learn about today. And we can't do that without you. So we're going to tell you how and why to join us. Thanks, Nicole. So now I'd like to introduce our main speaker, Dr. Adam Resnick. Adam Resnick is the Director of Data-Driven Discovery in Biomedicine at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia where he's responsible for leading a multidisciplinary team to build and support a scalable patient-focused healthcare and educational discovery ecosystem on behalf of all children. Adam's research is focused on defining the cell signaling mechanisms of oncogenesis and tumor progression in brain tumors. His lab studies cell signaling cascades and their alterations in pediatric brain tumors to elucidate the molecular and genetic underpinnings of each tumor in an effort to identify and develop targeted therapies. Adam serves as scientific chair for several consortia-based efforts, including the Children's Brain Tumor Tissue Consortium and Pacific Pediatric Neuro-Oncology Consortium, which include more than 20 pediatric hospitals across the globe. Um, Adam earned a dual bachelor's degree in neuroscience and English and literature from the University of Florida before completing a PhD in neuroscience from Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. We are thrilled to have you join us, Adam. So now I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Um, it's such a great um, privilege to be here and to really partner and work with uh, NF2 Biosolutions and the NF2 community. What I thought I would do today is um, really focus on how we've been thinking about the power of biospecimens in the context of the research and discovery cycle and both the opportunities, challenges, and synergy that can be harnessed um, by creating a new model for research, which I think really NF2 Biosolutions is a 
real leader um, of not just for NF2, but really across the rare cancer landscape, um, how do we address the challenges of discovery on behalf of accelerated impact for patients? As you heard, I'm actually a trained neuroscientist and have spent um, my career really focused on pediatric brain tumors. And just like NF2 itself is a rare condition, uh, brain tumors in children are also rare. Um, and obviously those two areas overlap. And as a scientist, I was very naive when I first began my research, um, thinking that the hardest part was going to be to come up with ideas and the questions that a scientist needs to ask. But it turns out that in order to even ask those questions and really harness um, the most modern and leading edge technologies on behalf of the emerging opportunities for translational research, you have to actually have a substrate to do that research on. And that ends up being patients and samples. And so I'll walk through how we've been thinking about this really from my, from my own point of view as a scientist, but also the partnerships and relationships and networks that are required to actually uh, inform this. So in this screen, you can see me uh, standing up the shoulder of uh, Yun Kun Zhu, who is a trained data scientist and bioinformatician. And it's only through the partnership that even I, the scientist, can advance my own research. But before either of us can ask any meaningful questions, we have to have biospecimens. So I'll talk about this and the networks that are required. So almost every presentation that I either attend or give begins with a statistic of some kind. Um, so for example, this is just one version of the NF2 statistics of the um, incidence and prevalence of NF2 of being one in approximately 25,000 people worldwide. And the challenge that presents in actually addressing um, NF2. NF2 also, as a disease context, presents a challenge because of the kind of disease that it is. So in, in general, um, in the context of cancer, um, alterations in genes fall into two categories. Um, one is that it's an oncogene, meaning that it is a, a switch that is stuck in the on position. And the other is that it's a tumor suppressor or a gene that is stuck in the off position. And it turns out um, that it's much easier um, to turn something off that is stuck in the on position than to turn something on that is in the off position. What I mean by that is um, there are many different ways to essentially, you can think about this this way, um, disrupt the functioning of something that's working. So if you wanna stop a car from running, there are almost an infinite different ways that you can break a car, but there are only a certain way, a number of ways that you can make a car work. Um, and as a result, just targeting the NF2 context, uh, the loss of function of NF2 itself is a challenge that's not unique to NF2. And the reason I bring this up is because contextualizing the challenge in a rare disease in the context of biology begins to outline that it's not as rare as one might think. It turns out that there are many diseases underpinned by the loss of a tumor suppressor. Um, and there are common set of approaches that you can empower scientifically to address the loss of a tumor suppressor. But in order to do that, you have to understand the biology of that tumor suppressor. And I think this is one of the things that NF2 Biosolutions is really driving to. And one of the things that you've seen even in the projects that um, Nicole highlighted. But the challenge is the following. Nicole highlighted four projects that uh, NF2 Biosolutions is supporting. If you actually go to the NIH um, website and look at NIH Reporter and you query NF2 and schwannoma, for example, you'll find that in totality, the NIH is funding 
currently, as of today, 14 projects. That is a very small number of projects and investigators for uh, a disease that is underpinned by a very challenging uh, biological question. If you do the same query in another tumor suppressor, one that again uh, has its oftentimes um, its origin in uh, a mutation that you're born with, something like BRCA or BRCA and breast cancer, you'll find that there are more than 420 projects on BRCA and breast cancer. Both settings are trying to solve the same problem from a cancer perspective. How do we address the loss of a tumor suppressor in the context of cancer? But the resource allocation between those two are very different, making it extremely challenging to understand that disease. And this is the first place where you need biospecimens to empower uh, the discovery. It turns out that there have been many, many biospecimens collected for breast cancer in contrast to NF2. But the opportunity goes further. If you actually take a look at NF2 and you query um, in one of the systems that we develop and I'll talk about briefly, um, all tumors across all biology um, for the presence of NF2 alterations. What you'll find is that NF2 alterations occur um, across many different cancers. So this is a, a chart that looks at more than 80,000 samples across all cancers. Um, and it's asking the question, how many of those can samples are mutated for NF2? And you can see the different cancer types listed on the bottom, but it turns out that while NF2 itself is a one in 25,000 um, uh, context disease, um, if you look at NF2 as a gene, um, it's two out of every hundred cancer samples. And again, unless you harness connectivity and find ways to connect an NF2 um, patient sample to all the other samples and cancer biology that exist, you miss the opportunities to really drive co-discovery and accelerated impact, which I'll talk about. So here you can see I'm querying for NF2 across all cancers and the prevalence is 2%, meaning two out of every 100 samples have an alteration in NF2. So when I, as a scientist, and then partners of mine and CHOPAs at institutions and other pediatric hospitals got together around 2011 to really think about how do we harness um, new discoveries through biospecimen-based research, we began developing this model in our sort of mental framework of how to empower research. We recognized that specimens are analog, usually local, um, in one environment, in one particular hospital or operating room. Um, and in order to take that specimen and drive discovery through new technologies, you have to go through these series of steps. Uh, the samples have to be collected. They have to be well annotated. You have to transform them from being analog to being digital in nature. The minute you extract information from those samples, in the form of DNA sequencing or RNA sequencing or any other molecular profile, when you begin to measure that sample, you can then take that data and put it in platforms or resources that suddenly empower that specimen's information to become available for researchers in a global manner. So suddenly you go from something that's isolated and siloed to something that's empowered and discoverable. Getting there requires platforms um, that structure that information and that allow for as rapid a process of providing that information for access, but also that that information is contextualized and connected to other information. 
because the real goal is not to only empower four laboratories or 14 laboratories, but to ensure that every cancer researcher who is studying a particular disease can connect across that network and information that each one of those two samples in any other disease that has NF2 is connected to any NF2 sample to look for ways to optimize around opportunities for discovery. The reason we draw this as a double funnel is exactly for that purpose, because you want to funnel in both patients and researchers and clinicians into a common architecture or infrastructure to support this. And so when we began thinking about this, we really began thinking about this initially across all brain tumors in children, recognizing that it's very challenging to build that kind of infrastructure for any one disease type on its own. But if you actually harness coordination of those efforts, you can leverage and support other diseases and the researchers who are focused on it. I sometimes think about this in the way that if uh, you live in a small town on the East Coast and um, you want to get to a town on the West Coast, you're not going to count on your local township or county to build the road all the way from the East Coast to the West Coast. You're going to look and try to harness um, infrastructure built by hopefully your country um, that connects across that uh, landscape, but allows individual communities and um, uh, cities to connect uh, across each other. Um, and balancing that opportunity for both local and domain specific impact and knowledge to then connect and harness common infrastructure really represents the kind of partnership um, and opportunities that we've been exploring with NF2 Biosolutions. So the way that we really began our own efforts um, was to, to launch the Children's Brain Tumor Network in um, 2013. This began with four institutions. Um, today we have about 18 institutions. And along the way, at each one of these time points uh, that's shown on the screen, we iterated and experimented around what's required to link across those opportunities. Initially, how do you support biospecimens and their, their centralization as a common resource for all researchers? So how do you de-silo the specimen and how do you support bringing in those specimens? Key to that are patient communities. This is actually one of the strengths of rare disease communities. It turns out, for example, that only 4% of all adult common cancer patients are in clinical trials. That's in contrast to almost probably 90% of children um, with cancers. The rare disease context allow people to connect and coordinate their activities in much better ways than the common and prevalent disease context. And so what we found is as you focus on rare disease communities, you can partner across those communities and look and assess as to how to best build common infrastructure for bringing in all those biospecimens into a common transparent and accessible repository that then allows researchers and communities to leverage those uh, specimens for research, converting those specimens into reusable and accessible and connected data sets that then further inform drug development and therapeutic intervention. That's that first part of the funnel. Um, and so today, um, as that partnership has expanded to include clinical trial networks like the Pacific Pediatric Neuro-Oncology Consortium, we have more than 30 participating institutions with more than 3,500 subjects already enrolled. And each one of those already has a specimen inside this biorepository. And it spans across all tumor types. So it does include schwannomas and meningiomas and ependymomas. And that's where we have then opportunities to connect and partner with the NF2 um, biosolutions community because connecting that broad architecture 
to focused and dedicated efforts is the real next step of these efforts. It turns out that you actually have to connect more than just 30 institutions. Um, and I think this is where um, many of the next phase of our efforts are heading, particularly in the context of NF2 and something that NF2 Biosolutions has been a champion of empowering. Specifically, once you create these portals and shared resources, there's no reason why you have to really restrict your focus to only 30 institutions. Instead, maybe you can actually support every single NF2 patient, no matter where they are, which institution or which hospital, and their capacity to then connect and um, engage in this network. When we began developing this, the National Institute of Health also recognized this opportunity and supported the development of cloud-based platforms that further allowed us to expand beyond uh, brain tumors to support all pediatric cancers um, within this context, and uh, as well as other rare diseases and congenital birth defects, really empowering a common platform for rare disease discovery in ways that the mandate of the Kids First um, program is to support cross-disease discovery. And so it's this combination of patients, their clinicians, integrated into an architecture that supports connectivity across resources, that then is linked to a dedicated focus that harnesses a community like NF2, that provides what we think of as a new model for discovery and research. Inherent in, in doing this is the need to empower discovery across multiple dimensions of research. And biospecimens is the first place that we start. And the way that I like to think about it is something like uh, this image that many of us are familiar with, where essentially, um, for those of you who are watching, if you look at this, you might be able to uh, sort of see the image in this picture. But it turns out if you cover one of your eyes, you will never be able to see the image. And that's because it tur turns out you have to have two eyes looking at the same image from a slightly different position in order to see the DNA hel helix emerge in that image. And that that's exactly what we are trying to support in the context of a biospecimen driven discovery ecosystem where the biospecimens really are the starting point for the discovery process. Once that biospecimen is collected and data are generated, the most important part is for that data to then be connected to as many people to look at that data and further connect it. Because it's only through that process that you can maximize that translation of information to knowledge, where people can hypothesize and iterate around the role of NF2 in biology? Are there common ways to target a tumor suppressor loss? How do we harness these common workflows to address a shared biology? But the sample is only the first part. As all of you know, when you say NF2, it doesn't just mean one version of a disease. Um, there are many different ways for NF2 to present um, and across different time with different really heterogeneous mix of individuality for patients. And in order to harness that individuality on behalf of a precision medicine approach, you actually wanna capture as much of that individuality. So it's not enough to know that there's a patient with NF2 or to just define the mutation of NF2. You actually wanna know every single element of that disease process as captured across different modalities. So when we collect specimens, we not only collect the specimens, we also collect the operative report, the pathology report, the um, radiology report, the imaging, and link all of those to the specimens. 
these different modalities then allow us to harness the differential expertise of different experts. Pathologists look at slides and see something very different than when a neuroscientist looks at the slide. But I see something very different when I look at the gene network than a pathologist. Similarly with radiology and every other context. It's really harnessing this combination of expertise that allows us to then further delineate both what is shared and what is different among different NF2 patients in ways that can allow us to think about a precision-based approach for a disease like NF2. The other really important part is collecting as many samples from the same patient. Um, this is something that is uniquely empowered in the context of NF2. For many other cancers, it is very, very challenging to get anything beyond just that first surgical sample. But NF2 is a, dis a disease context that has longitudinality and hopefully a lifetime of context. And what you'd learn is that time is another variable that cancer optimizes around. So for example, here we have you know, an NF2 patient with schwannoma where we've uh, been able to capture two samples. Those two samples, both of them have a loss of NF2 function. But what you can see, if you look at the rows where it says uh, samples um, and then genes, you can see that not both samples, sorry, both samples do not always contain the same alterations of genes. Cancer harnesses uh, networks itself. And so NF2 alterations are not the only change that happens within a tumor or a lesion. It actually is a combination of changes in those. And that combination is oftentimes um, unique to patients, um, but then also changes across time or in different locations. And that creates the need for us to really collect samples from different tumor types, different locations, different lesions, even in the same patients in order to really understand how the cancer is driving um, the biology and what are the vulnerabilities that we can harness to target it. So when you layer institutions, patients, samples across time within a framework and architecture for discovery, you then can harness connectivity across very different projects um, that allows for those discoveries to begin uh, getting empowered. And so since we launched the Children's Brain Tumor Network, not only have we partnered with NF2 Biosolutions, but at every step, new projects emerge, including a proteogenomic project in the NIH, new portals that now capture that additional layer of proteomics and genomics together. Empowering the discovery in other environments for researchers who may never have even thought about studying NF2 or um, uh, any pediatric brain tumor. On top of proteomics, new single cell initiatives, and that began emerging. Again, another data modality providing another eyeball to look at the same tumor, but from a different perspective. Um, and that data, again, is connected to the NCI data resources. The data within the Kids First environment is now also flowing into other NIH environments, other partnerships, for example, with the American Association for Cancer Research and Project Genie, and partnerships with investigators across the globe, including um, an initiative across 11 countries within Europe for, with whom we share all the data uh, called the Individual Pediatric Cure, um, a global initiative called ICGC that intersects the processed or discovered mutations across all cancers around the globe, 
And even initiatives that are state-based, like the Kentucky Cancer Registry, um, that's really focusing on disparities of cancer prevalence across Appalachia. We also partner with other foundations like the Alexis Lemonade Stand Foundation and their Childhood Cancer Data Lab, where through an open science initiative are providing real-time access to data sets, to scientists, even before the data are published in a scientific journal to harness collaborative discovery, where, as you can see on the screen, each one of these folders represents another analysis performed by another set of scientists in almost real time um, across data. And so this combination is where we're heading next, is to recognize that you can harness commonalities and empower the differences across patients and networks. Um, there are epidemomas that occur sporadically and epidemomas that occur in the context of NF2. You want to make sure you connect across those two settings. Likewise in meningioma or schwannomas. And this is really no different than the way that cancer operates. So Merlin is the protein name for uh, the product of NF2. And this is not only unique for NF2, but almost every gene that's implicated in cancer, every tumor suppressor or oncogene is actually part of a cellular network. And cancer is an expert at harnessing networks. It's the way that cancer resists therapy and it's the way that it accelerates growth. It connects one protein, the mutant protein, to many, many other proteins. All these arrows here are really just points of connection between the network. And it, we believe that in order to really combat any one network, you actually have to apply network principles, which is really what I think NF2 Biosolution is driving towards. And when you do that, when you harness these types of network principles underpinned by beginning collections of samples, you really are optimizing against a different variable. You're no longer are optimizing against a variable of limited knowledge and limited access. What you're really optimizing then is against time and how rapidly you can convert that sample into knowledge and impact through connectivity and its availability to researchers, clinicians. And when you shift the equation to thinking about acceleration, where the goal is to really accelerate the process of discovery, once you solve the biospecimen layer, you are fully empowered to iterate around principles of acceleration. How do you connect as many researchers to that sample? How do you generate as much data as possible across different modalities? And most importantly, how do you then provide accelerated real-time impact to patients. Over um, the time period that we've been partnering with NF2 Biosolutions um, on empowering biospecimen-based discovery, we've already made tremendous progress, uh, really thanks to the work of the NF2 Biosolutions team. I think they are a powerhouse of connectivity the number of surgeons and institutions with whom we've met in a unit time is unprecedented. Um, and we've been doing this for more than uh, 15 years almost now. The amount of connectivity and meetings and conversations and agreements across this network of patients and surgeons and hospitals is just unprecedented. And in a very short amount of time, we've already received 35 new patient refer referrals, 22 patients who have consented uh, um, to be uh, to working on hearing impaired consents for five patients of those. Um, and as you can see, this is an exponential um, trajectory um, that we hope to further engage in and further support. And even though we've made this much progress across specimens, infrastructure, data-driven discovery, 
and supporting access to those resources. We are still, um, we, we still see a way forward that can be further accelerated through more patients enrolling. Patients are really the true drivers of this process. Again, a unique component of NF2. And each time a patient is empowered to support the use of their biospecimen and their data, that patient's connectivity to the network is not just additive, but synergistic. And so where we see ourselves heading in partnership with NF2 Biosolutions is to build on that biospecimen connectivity for real time use of that data and the return of that data to patients themselves. So this is still not available, but this is where we think we need to head. And it will be empowered by biospecimen based resources. So the minute you have a canvas against which you can position any patient, the minute you have a network of clinicians and researchers leveraging cell lines and biospecimens for reproducible research, you can then begin to position every new patient that comes through a hospital door into that context. And when you do that, harnessing this network and resource, you can provide real-time impact for patients so you can understand their biology in real time. You can support the decision-making around their biology in real time. And that's actually something that's incredibly unique about NF2. Something that oftentimes is discussed in the context of adult cancers, but very um, uh, often is neglected in the context of pediatric or young adult cancers. And that is that prevention and measurement um, is inherent in NF2. Um, unlike many other pediatric cancers, um, NF2 is a context of the need for constant measurement, constant surveillance, the integration of that data in ways that then determines when you should act and how you prevent um, the need for action. That's an incredibly powerful way to think about pediatric cancer um, or any disease. And the reason I'm saying that is because as challenging as NF2 is, it's also a place for innovation around how we think about um, cancer as a whole. Um, if we can solve the problems and challenges of addressing NF2, it won't only solve NF2, it will solve many other cancers um, in ways that nobody's thinking about because so many of those cancers are not really cancers that people are screening for, that they are monitoring in real time. Um, so many of those contexts are uh, point in time uh, activities as opposed to really a um, living, breathing ecosystem that you are trying to navigate. And there, so for us, working with NF2 Biosolutions and you as a patient community provides an unprecedented context for thinking about how do we address real-time impact, continuous integration of data, and optimize around time and the need to act at the appropriate time in ways that we are um, unable to do in almost any other uh, disease context. And so with that, um, I'll just end and uh, open it up for question. I hope this was a good introduction to the network and ecosystem that NF2 Biosolution is building with us in the Children's Brain Tumor Network um, and the opportunities to really transform the way research is done and the way that patients are impacted um, as we move forward with the advancement of new technologies and new therapeutic interventions for NF2. Thank you so much, Adam. That was really interesting and fascinating. And I, we just really appreciate all the work you are doing. And it's really great to hear how you are connecting all of these dots. So that's amazing. 
Um, now we're going to hear from Gilles and his daughter, Karen, and just to give us a little bit of the background of their experience with actually donating tissue. And then we will open it up for Q&A. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Adam, for, for the presentation. And um, I hope that we, you all understood the real need that we have uh, to collect as many as tissue as we can. Uh, so my daughter, Karen, that is next to me, she's 13 years old now. Uh, she was diagnosed uh, when she was six years old. Two years ago, we did a vestibular schonoma surgery. Uh, it was in Paris. And uh, when we started with the NF2 biobank of uh, Adam, we, uh, we requested to have the tumor transferred. So even if you had a, a surgery in the past, you can request, you can connect to a uh, to uh, the NF2 biobank, and they will request the tumor to be transferred. So that's one tumor. But as well, uh, we last summer uh, with Karen, we went to uh, to also remove uh, plexiform schwannoma, so skin schwannoma. Uh, and uh, I would like Karen to tell you how easy it was, how fast it was, and uh, that's a very important thing to do, even plexiform schwannoma, because when we remove them and they are fresh and immediately sent to the biobank, then we can develop cells line. And that's what the researcher needs. They need tissue and also cells line. So please, Karen, tell us uh, your experience. Uh, what happened? What did we do last summer instead of having a vacation? <laughs> um, yeah. So we went to, to the clinic, right? Mm -hmm. And which uh, tumor they removed from you? From you? Mm -hmm. Yes, take them. Take another. Yeah. So they removed from from the head and from the foot. And uh, how easy was it? Was painful? No. It was quick. How long it took? Thirty minutes. Thirty minutes. Yes. So they remove uh, the uh, a tumor under the scalp and one on the foot. It went uh, very fast. It, the, after that, you could walk. You could. Uh, play yeah yeah so it was really not uh, disruptive at, at all and uh, and uh, the tumor was collected by the team of adam and immediately sent to the biobank and they are working on it to develop a cell line so we need as many as fresh tumor uh, to in order to develop more cell line because uh, all the researcher we're talking to they want to test their their therapy on different type of cell line so uh, I hope uh, it gave you a sense of uh, uh, how easy it could be for skin tumor. Obviously, when there is an internal tumor, it's a more complex, but these tumors are also collected in the same way. Uh, so if you have any questions, uh, please, you can uh, um, share your questions in the chat, and we'll be answering too. I'll just... also, I, would, I would like to add, sorry, uh, we collect tissue from everybody, so from adults, uh, from any age, uh, we are using the infrastructure of the Children Brain Tumor Network. So that's why you saw the name children a bit everywhere, because that's the infrastructure. But we are collecting tissue for everybody, and this tissue is used for labs that are working on a therapy for everybody as well. Yeah. And that's an important point, um, um, that infrastructure of the Children's Brain Tumor Network also connects to adult uh, tumor samples that are also in the bio. We almost have as many adult brain tumors, for example, in the biorepository as we have pediatric. And it's that continuum of research um, that's really important. Um, and something, again, that NF2 has the unique power to connect. Many times there's a disconnection between pediatric and adult context, um, but NF2 is the unique context for empowering this discovery. And as Gilles men mentioned, the opportunity to collect multiple samples from different locations across time not only empowers the generation of new models, but also new and um, important understanding about the disease process itself. I'll just, um, before we go over the questions, I'll just give a 30 second um, overview of, how, of my experience donating my son's tumor. He had just eight weeks ago, a vestibular schwannoma removed in Boston by Dr. Welling and everything went very, very well, but it was one of the most stressful times of my life. And I think that's a big concern with a lot of people 
you know, I'm going through enough dealing with the surgery and recovery. I don't want to add anything else to my plate. So this was the easiest and most seamless um, process, especially how things can go sometimes in academia. This was absolutely the easiest thing I've ever done. I had a 10 minute phone conversation to go over um, the consent with um, Adam's team member, Shannon. And we, once that was done, they took care of everything. There was no cost to us as the patient. They had a courier come to Boston to pick up the sample so that it was fresh and has a higher likelihood of success with creating a cell line. They hand delivered that to the team at CBTTC. And I've seen, you know, I even went down to the lab to look at it the other day, I see his cells growing and it's just amazing. And I didn't have to do a thing. I just, we showed up for surgery and it all happened in the background and everything was as easy as can be. And obviously there's nothing, some of it, the tumor was sent to pathology there at the hospital so they could, uh, you know, confirm what it was and everything. But then the rest of it got sent over to CBTTC. So it was really easy and there's really no um, downside of doing it. There's no cost, there's no effort, there's really no reason not to. So if you have a, um, surgery coming up, let us know. All it takes is an email to Shannon and the patient and then 10 minutes to go over a consent and that's about it. So I see a whole bunch of questions popping up here. So let's um, take a look at those. So let's start with this one. This is an interesting one. Can cord blood be donated and would it be useful? I haven't I thought about that one yet. Yeah, so um, the, we haven't uh, uh, centralized a collection of cord blood, um, but there are potential applications of cord blood um, for um, the discovery process. Um, if you have cord blood already saved, maybe it's something we should discuss uh, with you and really assess um, when and if it's appropriate to transfer uh, cord blood, but also the collection of the patient's um, current patient's own blood, um, if that hasn't been made available, and or uh, especially other um, samples, as Gilles mentioned, um, is also the opportunity we would advocate for. Thank you. Now here's a great one from Barbara. Can the tumor be tested against a drug screen? So there are a couple of different ways that we try to empower this. Um, in fact, this is one of the key unmet needs in NF2. Um, there have been many large scale drug screens um, advanced for more common uh, cancers. Um, once you have a preclinical model, a cell line or a xenograft, then that's exactly what you would wanna do is to um, one, uh, go through a drug screen process. And that's actually what we're doing across many of these preclinical pre models, either ourselves within the context of the consortium or by providing those cell lines to laboratories who are themselves um, performing either a drug screen or a CRISPR screen, a loss of function screen for them. Thank you. And I think there's also the option of sending, if anybody had a specific lab that they would want their cells sent to, for example, if you had a relationship with another research team, which a lot of the NFT patients do, would that, would be, would that be possible also, Adam? Oh, yeah, exactly. So um, in fact, that's actually one of the more, more important things that um, uh, patients and families and foundations can do is connect um, the resources. Oftentimes investigators may or may not know of available resources. Um, so we will fulfill that request always. Um, and that's actually true. I see a last question that maybe is related to that. Um, that's true for um, US-based researchers or any researchers across the globe. Um, likewise, we've launched um, uh, platforms in Australia, in Europe um, to make the data rapidly available in those environments. And so we actually have clinical trial networks within Europe and in Australia and in Asia, leveraging both the data and the preclinical models. Um, so we don't see any boundaries um, as it relates to uh, national or geopolitical uh, landscapes. Well, that's actually the next question I was going to present to you. We've got several questions here about donating from overseas and if that's possible and how to go about doing that. Yeah, so it is possible. Um, we actually have overseas partners and hospitals that support that. 
Um, we do it in very much the same way um, that we do it in the United States um, in terms of providing the specimen kits and the shipping containers. Um, though only on other variables are some of the differences related to the consent process that we ensure alignment with. So for example, in Europe, um, there's a process called the GDPR that um, is slightly different than the HIPAA uh, context that we have in the United States. Both of them, actually, the main goal of both of those government policies are to empower patients, um, but require slightly different languaging in the consent uh, form itself, which we then accommodate. Great, that's awesome. And I think, um, Gilles, you already had a sample sent from Paris, right? So that, um, was that a smooth yeah, process? It, yes, it is, it is being processed, yes. Great, so that is absolutely possible. So don't let geography hold yeah. you back. Um, yeah. I think just going through the list here, Terry asked about the process for getting tissues. If you're planning a surgery, um, just let us know. You can email info at nf2biosolutions.org um, or any of us, me, Gilles, or any of us on the board, or any of the ambassadors, we'll connect you to Adam's team. Um, our contact point there is Shannon Robbins. She's been absolutely fantastic with being responsive and getting everybody signed up and going over the consent. So we'll take care of that. Um, Going down, let's see, the process for, so John asked the process about um, what we were just discussing about getting archived frozen tumor sent, um, pretty much the same. Just mm -hmm. let us know, we'll connect you with the team and um, get that taken care of there. It, there's some paperwork involved on the back end with the institution where it is stored and if the um, sample is still there, depending on how long it's been. That's institution dependent. Some save them for longer than others. So we just have to take that on a case by case basis. Um, Claire's asking us here a little bit about somebody whose name is Sylvia, but it looks like she meant to say saliva. Is um, saliva useful at this point? Yeah, so we collect saliva as well. And we essentially use sort of the, um, you know, ho uh, uh, the home test kits for saliva that, you know, you can actually uh, order online to uh, interrogate your ancestry. So it's very is easy. Um, you really just spit into this saliva tube. And the reason it's important, um, especially for context like NF2, is because we know that um, there are likely combinations of what are termed germline um, mutations that then intersect with these somatic mutations. So each one of the tumors has a contribution from your, the genome you might've been born with, plus the additional alterations that happen in that particular tumor. Additionally, it turns out that um, there are, you have more than 20,000 genes um, and each one of us is unique in that context. So also collecting parental saliva uh, adds additional information because as each um, child is born, um, whether or not you have NF2, that child not only inherits a combination of different genes and their variants from their parents, but actually also every single child has new mutations in their genome. So understanding how NF2 interacts with the other landscape of the genome is probably another element of trying to interpret the unique presentation that each patient might have. Um, and that's one of the challenges that's still remaining. So collecting saliva from both the patients and their parents uh, is something that we uh, strongly advocate and support. About saliva, so if you are living abroad, it's, it's easy as well. They send you a box, we did it. You receive a box, a little tube, you spit in it. You, you close the box, you send it back by FedEx, and that's it. So there's no, no border issue. We've done that one also. It takes a little while. It's a fair amount of saliva to fill it, but it, it's easily doable. So I think that answers Amy's question about the purpose. It's to compare to the parents and just look for patterns there. Um, let's see. We've got a question here about what research is being conducted on the fresh tumor samples. Um, pretty much right now, we're just getting started with that and growing cell lines. And then Adam, everything pretty much Adam has referred to is yeah. what's going to happen, but maybe you can add yeah. a little to that. Sure. Um, you know, part of the, the 
you know, historically, many times that people perform surgeries, the samples go into a paraffin embedded uh, context. And while there is, there are studies you can do from paraffin embedded or FFPE samples, which is what most pathology labs have, the amount and number of different questions you can ask from either fresh tissue or fresh frozen tissue dramatically expands. Um, so not only can you generate preclinical models um, from either fresh or fresh frozen tissue, but you can also ask um, questions about the single cell context, uh, better understand the expression profile, um, support proteomic analysis. So the number of different assays you can do really expands dramatically if you can either uh, support fresh frozen tissue, um, and then importantly, if you can generate cell lines. Uh, to add on that, so with the fresh tissue, we can make cell lines. And uh, the labs that uh, Nicole presented at the beginning, they want cell lines. That's right. So these, the research that we are supporting, the four different approach, and even the fifth one, they are all waiting for cell lines. They want more different type of cell lines, just one is not enough. Yeah, and I should, have, I should have highlighted this maybe a little bit better, but if you look at the way that um, a drug becomes a drug, um, a key step in that process uh, is preclinical validation and testing. Um, and preclinical oftentimes means cell lines or xenografts. Um, it's very challenging to skip that step. And so if you want to apply new therapies, um, simply from the perspective of the FDA or pharmaceutical companies, you have to go through a preclinical model space. It also is an area where you can then modify those cell lines and uh, explore uh, different ways to target tumors in a reproducible way. And cell lines are also oftentimes, if you're successful in generating them, are non-depletable. So if you have a tumor sample, each time you take a piece off and do an assay, um, you're depleting the tumor, but generating data. If you can convert tumors into a preclinical model, like a cell line, it can become a um, infinite resource because those cells proliferate um, and then you can simply allocate and distribute them to different partners. So cell lines or preclinical models are oftentimes a non-depletable resource that again, dramatically expands um, the potential for discovery. All right, so thank you. Next question here, and there's a little more to add to this. Marianne has asked um, about shelf life of samples and we had a, have discussed baby teeth in the past. Are baby teeth something that are useful um, to be transferred to CBTN? Yeah, so the shelf life of sample is, um, I, don't, I don't wanna say infinite, but very long time. Um, and that's because you can actually, um, even cell lines, you can actually freeze cell lines. So essentially they're live or living cell lines um, in a liquid nitrogen or minus 200 degrees Celsius. And 2000 years from now, thaw those cell lines and they'll be back alive. Hopefully 2000 years from now, we would have solved NF2. So we don't have to wait that long. But um, what it means is that um, there's continual opportunity to use those samples as new uh, technologies advance. And that's the key part, right? You wanna essentially align the best leading edge technology to the availability of samples and cell lines. So that longitudinality of availability is an important key step. Um, baby teeth can also be a, a good source of DNA um, and you can essentially, um, it's just a matter of, of assessing what's the best source for DNA, whether it's saliva or baby teeth, or you know, what do you have at hand to really represent um, that disease context? And so we've done that as well. I think in, just to add to that, that if the um, person wishing to donate is still 
living um, blood or saliva or tumor, tumor would be preferable, but of course there's lots of families who unfortunately have lost their loved ones to NF2 and a, a one way to honor their memory would be to let them to contribute, uh, let them contribute to something that wasn't around when they were, um, passed away. So that would be an opportunity if there were some um, baby teeth, you know, it's a very difficult topic to address, but if, you know, if there's anybody who wants to do that, we're, that's why we're doing this to yeah. help families have a way to contribute to the answer. Yeah. And just provide just a little bit of a lens on that. The most empowered analysis is to compare the so-called germline or um, DNA that you were born with to the tumor DNA. So you can imagine a setting, again, in the worst case possible where um, you could get the tumor sample from the pathology lab and you can get the baby teeth from the parents and then you have those two things together um, in ways that completes that initial data set for someone who's no longer with us. And then that then empowers the discovery process and reuse of that forever. Yeah. And while we're talking about different sources, can you comment on blood versus saliva? Is there one that is preferable or is there a reason to, for any given um, patient to donate both blood and saliva? Uh, there are reasons to donate both. Uh, blood is preferable, but we recognize um, that it can be challenging to collect blood at times. Um, uh, and so, um, but we can make do with uh, saliva uh, as well. So, um, you know, saliva is very easy. You don't have to go anywhere. We can just send it to your home, like Jill's mentioned. Um, so we don't want there to be any barrier for providing those samples. But if you are in the clinic or getting surgery, then we wanna optimize around the collection of blood if possible um, from patients. Great. And then here's a great, a great question from Barbara. How can information and cell lines stored elsewhere be transferred or shared uh, with you? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, uh, so we're happy to uh, find out where there are cell lines and information about those uh, available, and we can integrate them into um, the portal available resource tools that we're developing for NF2 Biosolution. Likewise, um, we can also have a version of those cell lines stored within our biorepository to make further distributable from more than one place, um, and uh, as well respect any of the required governance or um, agreements in place for the use of those specimens. Um, so there are very many different models that we can support um, uh, resources that have already been generated elsewhere um, and integrate them. And we've done this um, in many other contexts. So, so please reach out to us and, and let us know. Um, and then we can work with that individual context, whether it's um, you know, having a representation of those cell lines within the repository, um, listing those available resources within the repository and how requests can be forwarded um, and or linking those specimens to and cell lines to the molecular data or genomic data that might be available and could be integrated into the platforms. Now just logistically, what's the best way for the families and patients to do this? Should we have them contact us first or is it better for them to reach directly to you and your team? For example, shall we share Shannon's email address here for everybody? I'm, I'm actually happy um, to for everything to flow through you guys, um, if, if that makes it easier for people to, to see you guys as sort of a one-stop shop. And then you guys can coordinate and link us because I know that you guys maintain um, strong connections. All right, so I will put up my email address in the comments here in the chat so that everybody can contact me um, when I they also put ready. my email, Nicole. Donate. And Gil's too. Yeah, any of us, honestly. This is one of the things I love about the CBTN team is there's so many of them that if you reach out to any one of them, they are always very quick and very responsive and they share. They, they're the best team I've ever interacted with. What? They're very communicative and responsive and we just love working with them. So we'll put our emails up there. Most people here probably have our information, but we'll put that in the comments as well. Okay, so next question from our friend Margaret. So is CBTTC interested in, and CB, just so everybody knows, CBTTC is 
the same thing as CBTN. They recently changed their name. So that might be confusing on some of the graphics. Some of them still have one or the other. Um, are they interested in collecting schwannomas from non-NF2 patients as a comparison? Yeah, and we, we, we currently do that. Um, so we actually collect, like, again, this is the, uh, I tried to highlight that that's one of the power um, sort of moves to pursue is to really link across NF2 and non-NF2 context to drive discovery, both in NF2 mutant samples and in the same histology, but not NF2 context. So we would very much support the integration of schwannomas, meningiomas, ependymomas, um, uh, any tumor context. Okay, that actually addresses the next two questions as well. The same question was asked regarding, is it that the same for meningioma and ependymoma just as it is for schwannoma? So you pretty much already That's right. uh, addressed that. All right, so from Tony, there is a doctor in California that is testing various single and combination protocols on fresh tumor to look for tumor shrinkage rather than trying to inhibit the various pathways such as mTOR, VEGF, RAC1, et cetera. Is this possible for NF2? Yeah, so I, I'm happy to at least uh, answer part of that. That's exactly the kind of, I think, um, process that, having the right kind of data at hand for particular tumors in samples and powers. Um, you know, so in my last couple of slides that sort of highlight that highlighted this real time context and the need to really integrate across the network of a particular patient's tumor beyond just NF2 mutation. So really understanding that molecular context of a particular patient's tumor allows you to make such a decision around targeting and there are two components to targeting. One is, are there already existing therapies and drugs available that you wanna make sure you repurpose and position for a patient? And so how do you make sure that you extract the right data to ensure that you know that you need to use this drug or combination of drugs? The other is the need to develop new approaches that don't yet exist. So even when you understand the biology, there may not be a therapeutic approach available. And that's the part that you actually need to develop. And that's actually um, true for many tumor suppressor uh, uh, affected diseases. So as I mentioned before, um, you know, BRCA uh, loss or P53 loss or NF2 loss, these are all tumor suppressors. Um, and in contrast to um, the list of um, genes you have there, which are all oncogenes, uh, targeting tumor suppressors is a little bit harder and requires alternative approaches at times uh, that could potentially be combined uh, with these approaches, but um, also require investigating new approaches. Thank you. So let's see, we have another question here from YL it's saying, um, wondering what the maximum age for a sample is. We did um, sort of address that, that, and he said there are some samples that the NIH has from 2010 to 2012. Would that still um, be useful to you? Yeah, exactly. So um, I was talking about um, the answer I provided was sort of prospectively a sample that we collect now, how long would be usable. But it's also true for existing samples elsewhere. Um, even if they weren't fresh frozen at the time, if they were embedded in paraffin, which most laboratories do, those could still be utilized for some assays. Um, and so there, we have not yet encountered an age limit on samples available and the potential utility of those samples in the context of a rare disease like NF2. But uh, just to be clear, to make a cell line that is a non-depletable resource like Adam was talking about, that does need to be a fresh sample, right, Adam? Exactly, right. And then it looks like we have one more question here um, relating to a little bit we talked about overseas. We have a patient who says she lives in Finland and had surgery two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And how 
should she advance um, trying to get us the sample? So why don't you um, send us an email and we'll take care of that. So did just take care of it. I just uh, sent an email to Shannon and I emailed her. I emailed Great. Lisa. To see how quick that goes, <laughs> ask and you shall receive. <laughs> so yeah, we will, um, we're happy to do that. We get requests several a day and I have to tell you, I've never seen a team who is as responsive as the folks at CBTN and they um, will get right back to you and figure out, you know, they do all the, the hard part, finding the contact person at the institution, finding the pathology lab there that has the sample stored. It's really very effortless and it makes such a huge impact. So there's not too much of a downside of this. I can't think of a downside. If anybody has a downside that they can think of and they want us to address it, please put it in the comments. Nothing. I see no more questions. So I guess we're, we're going to wrap it up here, but thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Adam Resnick for taking time out of your busy schedule to speak with us today. Um, also, thank you to Karen for sharing her experiences. And we want to thank all of today's participants who are here online with us for your support and for your interest in this topic. We truly hope you will donate tissue to help contribute to this research and finding treatments and a cure for NF2. And we are here to answer any questions. So thank you all. And thank you, Adam. It was amazing, fascinating, and as always, I love hearing everything you have to say. So we much appreciate it. Of course. Yes. Uh, and actually, I just noticed um, people are asking about uh, information about CBTTC or CBTN. Mm -hmm. You can go to, if you want to find out more, to um, cbttc.org, and you'll find out all the information there, as well as um, Nicole mentioned, we're just undergoing a rebranding effort from CBTTC to CBTN, from the Children's Brain Tumor Tissue Consortium to the Children's, Children's Brain Tumor Network. Um, but you can just go to either um, site, so cbttc.org, and then you can go to the info email if you'd like to talk directly to us. But uh, please feel free to go through uh, NF2 Biosolutions. Um, there's, like Nicole mentioned, they are also equally responsive, rapid, and uh, attentive, and we'll make sure to connect you with us. Great. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Have a Thanks wonderful so weekend, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.